Welcome to the latest episode of No Tippy Tappy Football brought to you by William Hill. Sam and I are here again. Pleasure nice to, to see, see you. you. As always. Always. And we are recording this the day after transfer deadline day. Did you have your eyes peeled on it all day, Sam? <laughs> well, uh, I was astonished again in the billions of pounds that are being spent in the Premier League particularly again. I, I, I thought that with the pandemic and with the, the fact that the Premier League was shut down and all the money that was lost in that particular time, it would be a pullback on the, the, the prices of football players across the world. And of course, how wrong was I? Because uh, uh, probably the last one from Chelsea was probably the biggest of all a, 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 a British record. And... Uh, I just, I don't know, it just worries me. It worries me, what if he doesn't work? What a commitment that is for eight years, because obviously they haven't shut that loophole yet, I don't think so. Yeah. They spread that payment over eight years, it's what, 121 million. Uh, so yeah. it's a huge, huge risk for the club, and uh, and particularly for the manager, because he'd get the blame if it doesn't work, and it wouldn't, I don't, I wouldn't think it would be his choice. Not his number one, but mm. that's the way the top end is now. You are not really the manager anymore. You are just a coach and you accept these players and try and do your best with them. Yeah, the Enzo Fernandez deal that went through last minute. I think you're referring to the, I think that the fancy name is something like amorization or something like yes. that, Sam. Yes, um, and I that's think, right. I think the loophole closes in the summer. But because it's obviously the day after transfer deadline day, we thought who would be the best guest that we could get today? Of course, it's a former footballer, current agent. Yes. And we managed it. And we welcome Ian Hart to join us today. Thank Thanks you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. And yeah. um, was it a busy day for you yesterday? Yeah, it was, well, to be honest, uh, yesterday morning, nothing was really happening. And then I got a phone call off Phil Parkinson at Wrexham. He was interested in the player I look after, Owen O'Connell uh, at Charlton. And pretty much happened very, very quickly. Um, I then found out about half five last night while I'm at home up near Newcastle that they, they want to get the deal done. So it was going to take me a long time to try and get across to Wrexham. Uh, they just told us to go to the office to sign off the paperwork. So all made his way off from Charlton and um, it got completed about half nine last night. So What? So that was a call you took yesterday morning? <laughs> this is this is a manager is one of the worst days if you still need a player. Yeah. And, uh, and and of course, it, uh, the the sitting and waiting. And I, I remember we sat and waited at West Brom on the last day for two players to come in. And I think uh, Nate Lynn Miles one of them from Arsenal. Um, and I think that, that you sit in your office and praying that it's going to come off like you mean because you don't know whether it is or it isn't. And the other side is if they're coming from abroad and uh, we signed a player from Spain, uh, there's no medical can be done. And, and luckily for us, well, it wasn't lucky for us, but there were only going to be loans hours. But if it's a permanent sign and it's that late, there is no medical. You can only just go off the past medical records and take the risk, like you mean. So it is the worst day of the season, uh, without any question of doubt, for, for the manager to, to try and get a deal over the line. That's why I've never been a, I've never been a fan of the, the window. I always think it used to be better in the old days, but, you know, nobody listens to oldens like me anymore about, about the fact that people could trade up until, I think, the last... Uh, the last Saturday in March and then the window shut from then till the end of the season. So there was never any desperation like there is now to get yourself out of trouble with injuries um, because the market was always open till then. But uh, unfortunately, that got shut many, many years ago. In fact, probably there's only people as old as me can remember that old window, like you mean. So, so uh, yeah, but it is what it is and it is a desperate situation for for many clubs and many managers, particularly the lads at the bottom of the league. Because they'll want to splash out and uh, to try and save save the hundreds of millions of pounds that you get uh, by staying in the Premier League. So, big pressure. It's a great, re great relief whether you get what you want or don't get what you want the day after. When you're saying, right, you can focus back on football. You can focus on, on the, the job at hand in, in the team that you've got. 
and uh, a lot of the distraction you get in the January window means that you're not there. You, you, you're actually dealing with, and like I said, now that's not perhaps the case as much now as it used to be because you're the coach rather than the manager. So you get less involved, still involved, but not as often. How did you, from an agent's point of view, how do you find the, the window and, and specifically this kind of the last day of the window? Yeah, I just think that well, you as a manager, Sam, you're probably thinking, why, why are the clubs not a bit more organised, leaving it so late, it's stressful time, trying to get, obviously, organised, whether it's trains or, or flights across for a player if he's coming from abroad. Yeah, it's a, it's a stressful time. Um, obviously, you spend so many hours on the phone. So when the window closed last night, you just relieved that it's over and finished with so you can go back and have a decent night's sleep but your brain's walking overtime still trying to rest but um yeah it's a, it's good it's um it's it's very competitive as well it's it's a that's it's a hard an understatement yes. <laughs> yeah. competitive is an understatement do, it's a dog eat dog it's yeah. um yeah it's sometimes it's not nice but um yeah i need a player as i look after i try and look after them properly because i've played the game myself try and give them the best honest advice um and hopefully you can guide them through, hopefully, a, a long, successful career. Well, we're going to get into some of the transfers that happened and get both your thoughts on them. Before we do, though, Sam, we need to talk straight away about Everton. Obviously, when we recorded our last episode, Everton didn't have a manager, and I was trying to push you to see if that's something you'd be interested in. They do have a manager now. Sean Dyche has the job. What was your reaction when you heard that? Well, for Sean personally, I'm, I'm pleased that he's got such a big club and uh and even at the at the wrong end of the table like myself when I went in um and I think that uh, his organization skills his experience and um and his knowledge and his personality because it's big for a, a today in terms of managing your personality has to um, galvanize the players you, you you have to breed confidence in the players. You have to. It's not just about training an organisation. It's about the how is the how is the individual feeling? What are they like? Not just physically, but mentally. And he's got all the tools now after years and years with Burnley, and it, most of it's in the Premier League to to deal with the trials and tribulations you'll come across at Everton, and of course, it is a big pressure because of the size and, and the demand of the fans, uh, but one you can easily overcome by a good organisation. And what most Everton fans saying, they want to see passion from the players. They want to see, you know, see them giving it all they've got and they will forgive a lot of stuff if you do all that. And I'm sure to Sean with the talent pool that he's got can get the best out of them. But I think the first thing uh, is sort the injuries out. And uh, and I think that um, as a manager or as a coach, um, your internal look, not just at the players, but the staff is critical. Because why have they not kept the players fit? Why have they not kept them on the pitch? Why have they not prevented injuries? Why have they? Because that's affecting Everton's result. It's affected uh, um, the selection process. And, uh, and 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 it's been a big struggle to get a team out on the pitch, and that's why they are where they are. So, uh, you know, Frank has has obviously had to suffer with that, but it's your responsibility as a manager to sort that out, even if it means sacking a few and getting a few more in to make sure that your policies are followed through by saying, "This is my policy that I want a prevention of injury program." You know, I don't want you to get them fit. After they get injured, I want you to keep them fit so they can get picked every week. And I think that's been one of Frank's big, big problems on on the fact that he hasn't been able to select the best players every week, uh, which would have easily, I think, uh, got Everton round mid table ish, just under there, and uh, and ultimately in the end, he's lost his position. I think uh, because of the lack of players that he wanted to select because of their injuries. I think it's the level of the level of details fans we don't always think about. Um, Ian, from yourself, you were at Leeds having huge highs, but also went through a period of lows as well with the relegation. Yeah. Do you feel that Everton are in a position? Can they survive this? I think they've got the right manager in. I think uh, Sean 
is, is a very good manager, obviously used to relegation battles. But ultimately, I, I look at I look at the players and I think them eleven players that he picks to go out. You know, as soon as they cross that white line to go to, go into war, they need to go out and fight for the short. I think a lot of them probably this season haven't performed. Um, and I think, obviously, what Sam has just said there, I think, you know, all the staff behind the scenes give them players the best opportunity, whether it's, you know, massages, the best of food, everything is done for them to give them no excuses to go out onto the pitch and perform, uh, put the bodies on the line. And um, I don't think there's enough players that have done that so far this season. Hopefully now that the new manager going in there can can get the most out of them players. Yeah, I think you. If he gets Dominic Calvert-Lewin... Yeah. In the right frame of mind, fit enough to stop worrying about his injuries psychologically, because that's his problem now. It's, physically, he's probably fine. Psychologically, he's, he's, he's been injured that long with so many injuries that where he's come back and got injured again, come back. That's a, if it's a long term injury and you know it's going to be a broken leg it's going to take but when he keeps getting these niggles and then this and it goes and he comes back and he goes back again this is puts doubt in your mind about when you're going on the pitch do you run as freely as you used to no do you work as hard as you used to no is it on the back of your mind that is this injury coming again yes so you've got to overcome those psychological barriers and do what you can to help him because he's the main man Apart from sorting the defence out, which is easy for Sean, because that's his forte. One of his fortes will be, you know, Burnley, one of the best defensive records in the Premier League, which everybody needs. Whether you're fighting relegation or winning the league, you have to have the best, one of the best defensive records. But if you get Dominic scoring, then, you know, one point will turn into three and that will get them out of trouble. So... He's probably the main man because I can't see anybody else who's sort of the right sort of goal scorer in the team. Mopé's not worked, and you know, so uh, you know that'll be that'll be a key key element for me. And uh, Jermaine Defoe, New Sunderland, when I went in trouble, one chance, one goal, two chances, one goal, three chances, two goals, eighteen goals in a struggling side. You know, I sorted the back out. He sorted, he sorted the goals out, and th- and that kept us up. You know what I mean? So that's what the that's what's needed for for Everton at the moment. Yeah, and what a player when he's fit. What what a player. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we've talking we've talked on this podcast a few times, Sam, about agents and kind of about the way you feel about agents, mm. kind of good and bad in football as it stands. What what where do you see in what is the role of an agent these days, and especially say on transfer deadline day. I just think it's you know there's there's lots of different agents, some good, some bad. Um, obviously, the, the reason why I got into it because I played the game. I was stung a few times by by different agents, and it's just to try and look after the player. I haven't been there, trying to give that guidance and advice to those young kids that are kind of you can only sign a, a player at the age of sixteen. So it's trying to guide them and advise them the best thing to do. Um, so the families. It's all going to be new to them as well. Just getting that honest advice to hopefully look after them through a, a long career. Um, but yeah, I've heard some horror stories, and it's uh, I'm sure you've dealt with plenty, oh, plenty, plenty as being a manager, Sam. So it's, crucial uh, to the game, though, Ian. Nowadays, they've, they've got so much power. The game, depending, so much power, yeah, yeah, yeah uh, definitely. I agree with there's that. There's some but... some big big agents out there. Well, you look at Dave Manessi at Stella, yeah. whether it's Will Solhouse at USM, yeah. um, the guys at BASE, but BASE and Stella are now merging together to be a global agent. So, yeah, there's, and, and they're, they're speaking not to the manager directly, they're speaking to the owners who have the power. So that's what it comes now. Like as a manager now, you're looking at Chelsea, does the manager bring all them players in? I probably think not, you know, and it's, it's sad when the manager doesn't have the power to bring the right sort of players in. Because if it doesn't work out, he loses his job. So one move this transfer window that I think shocked everybody was Jao Cancelo to Bayern Munich, one of City's most important and best players last season. Sam, what could have happened <laughs> to, for this to have happened so last minute? I, I just don't know. I mean, he didn't seem the type of player to to cause a problem. But, um, but obviously, it's from a distance, but he looked like one of the 
one of those sort of players you can rely on that comes in, dedicated, does his training, you know, goes on. But we don't really know the personality, do we? We don't really know that if he's not in the team, will he will he cope with it? Will he will he go and see the manager? Will he force the issue? Who knows? Like I mean, but certainly he's he must feel then he he could allow him to leave with the squad that he's got, which surprises me a great deal, but considering the the amount of games Man City play and the squad that they have is why they're the best in the league. Not the moment because Arsenal at the top, but they have the best squad in the league and uh, they have two 11s that are just as good as each other and that nobody else has that in the Premier League. So you can put one 11 out one week and that, then and the next 11 are just as good as the one from the week before, in my opinion, of course. Uh, so I'm surprised that he, he's let him go because... There's no more chance of bringing any more players in the window shut and and there's a long way to go to catch up Arsenal and, and obviously Champions League and uh, an FA Cup. So, you know, he must feel he's got youngsters in the squad and players in the squad like like Arker, who's come through as a, as a left back now around the centre half and he feels that he could let him go. But it was a, a strange decision from my point of view. Were you shocked when you heard Ian? Yeah, I think I think... Myself and probably every Man City fan was shocked. I was actually at the game on Friday when they played against Arsenal. And you're looking at the, the young right back is actually keeping Kyle Walker out of the team at the moment as well. So, yeah, something must have gone on. We don't know the situation, but it just goes to show you that kind of ruthless kind of edge of, of Pep. that Nobody is bigger than, than the team. Um, I'd love to know what, what went on, though. Rumours, plenty of rumours. You were about being late, weren't you? Like, I, mean, <laughs> I tell you what, I'd never get a team out with some of my teams about how many players used to be late now. Really? Oh, talk about laid back. I mean, like, in the end, you just go, you know, I may ever, they're not going to have any wages left at the end of the day if they carry on, you know what I mean? So it, it's that change of culture that we see in youngsters now. The old, you must turn up on time, you must have discipline. You know, they they come in wandering with their headphones on and look at you and go, oh, my alarm didn't go off or traffic on the road or... And, and it seems to be, well, you know, you know, well, you know. Well, we saw what Ten Hag did, though, yeah, when I mean, um, yeah. Rashford said that. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. You know, and that and that, that type of a, a, attitude as a, as a manager is much more difficult to instil. In our day, you were scared stiff of the manager. He, he, he would come in and he'd find you and just drop you and you go, oh, God, I can't afford to do that. Well, you that get him again. fined and then right out on the on the pitch, yeah. you're going to run. Yeah. yeah, that's it. It yeah. is. It's yeah. punishment. Yeah. Not it's only right. that, you're letting you're letting the manager down, but you're letting your teammates down as well. So, yeah, well, if the, if that has gone on, if he was late, if that's the case, but um, you would like to find out a bit of information, but nothing ever seems to come out of Man City. Yeah. I'd love to know. I'd love to know. <laughs> right. Especially you being a citizen. I know, yeah. I'm a citizen. <laughs> All right, okay. um, so, in terms of the best signings of the window, Sam, I'd love you to rank three, two, one for your best signings of the window. Um, so, we were chatting a little bit earlier and we had you in th- third. You were saying to me it was Harry Suter. Suter. What do you like about him as a signing for Leicester? Well, Le- Leicester particularly have got a problem defensively, which is we all know about the quality of Leicester's attacking football about the the players that they've got can handle the ball uh, can create perhaps not score as many goals as they should have done this season and um of course uh, at the back they've been conceding goals off set plays been conceding sloppy goals by giving the ball away in their own half and obviously bringing the the defender in could be a big uh, a big plus for for Brendan and the price I've sort of weighed up the, the the quality of the player and the price. Probably be a surprise. There's a lot more bigger transfers out there that people will say should be, you know, should be more on the on the list. But in terms of the value for money, what's needed for the football club and the manager at that moment, I think it's that's a good signing. So Harry Suter in third, and then you've gone for another what perhaps bargain for your second place. Yeah, another one because because if you want somebody that's in midfield, Janino. To be able to uh, pinch him from Chelsea, it's not an easy task. Uh, and the need uh, uh, has obviously been great because they haven't got uh, Casido, is it, from Brighton that they wanted. Um, 
So they've gone for a very experienced European player across Europe and in the Premier League with Chelsea from two or three seasons now who can slot into Arsenal's team quite easily and and do what they like doing. And that's he definitely keeps the ball. He's definitely one of those anchor men that just doesn't give the ball away, sits in the pocket and behind the back four and, and keeps the ball moving and keeps it moving forward, which is very important for uh, for Arsenal at the minute to try and maintain their position. Seems like a great buy because it's not even like he wasn't playing. Well, was it Chelsea? twelve million? Yeah, twelve million. You know million. what I mean? So you know, it's, you know, for me, you know, that looking at all the, the whole situation, that he's a good one. And then give us your best buy of the transfer window. Anthony Gordon, I think, Newcastle. Um, I don't know how, how strong that bid was from Chelsea before the window shut at summer, which was reputed to be sixty, seventy million. Um, but to let a young man go, um, forced his own way out, to be fair, by the looks of it, which I don't like. Um, an Everton boy, an Everton supporter. But you have to get the best you can. But I think forty-five million short of the real valuation of what we've seen in in some of the players that have been transferred this this window. But great for Newcastle, um, you know. But I'd say it was a bit of a bargain for them. Right. That's Sam's top three buys. Yeah, do you, do you <laughs> agree? Right. Are you having that? Well, to be honest, yeah, I think, I think um, yeah, it's very rare that you can get a Premier League player for 10, 15, 20 million pounds because they're normally into the 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, but yeah, I think Anthony Gordon's a great signing for, for Newcastle. I think they've been very, very clever in, in the, the players they brought in last January, obviously, to keep them up. And I think Eddie Howe's done a remarkable job at the football club. Obviously, last night they they won the game. They're now going to Wembley. We'll play Manchester United and nothing for us. So, I think Anthony Gordon's a great signer for for the club and, and the direction that they're trying to go in. Right, Ian, I'll have a chat now about <coughs> Leeds. Yeah. Um. Obviously, we mentioned you'd had some. You've had some incredible. Yeah, some incredible times. Their highs and lows. Obviously, getting to the semi final of the the Champions League yeah. as well. First of all, what did you make of their transfer window? They managed to keep hold of Jack Harrison. Yeah, I'd say Jack Jack is. He's had a really good season. Um, Tyler Adams, they've signed Brendan Arneson. I think the recruitment this this summer has been very, very good by by Victor Orta. Um, last year, they, they just survived, obviously, losing players like Rafinha, Calvin Phillips. So it was important that they got the right characters in that's going to help the team. Um, it's been a, probably a good start the season. The first few games, then they beat Chelsea, thinking, where will Leeds push on this season? But quite recently, the results haven't gone. They've played some great football, just haven't had the results. So hopefully with the, the few signings they've made, they can kick on for the second half of the season. Jesse Marsh, the right man for you? I think Jesse's done a good job. Um, of course, sometimes probably speaks a, a little bit too much. I think the fans would probably like to see they better, see, better they results. They can see through. Yeah. They well, can Le- see Leeds, through a bit Le- of BS, can't they? Le- Leeds fans, they're, they're very passionate yeah. and... Um, yeah, they're, they're not fooled by anything. But, yeah, I think the, the, the players they brought in for the second half of the season, uh, Wobbo, I think his name is, he's playing left side centre-back. He's uh, He did very well in, in the previous game. So it's uh, it's going to be a tough run in, but hopefully they've, they've got enough to survive. Think they can stay up, Sam? Oh, yeah, I think so. I think that, uh, you know, they, they, they... Obviously, I think one of the one of the problems has been that... that um, Getting the ball in the back of the net at the end of the day has been been there. They've created but not been able to finish, yeah. which was a particular problem for Brighton. Um, but the new manager at Brighton seems to have cured that now because they seem to be scoring goals <laughs> for fun now. Whereas under, under Graham, they were the better side but missed too many chances and Leeds seemed to create the chances but not, not have the right guy to... Uh, put that ball in the back of the net. So I think with Patrick Bamford, I think he's been injured quite a lot this season. Yeah. If you get a fit Patrick Bamford, he can score your goals. Um so he's back obviously he was back involved in the in the, the most recent game. Um and hopefully he'll stay fit because with him and Rodrigo, they've just signed a new player from I think it's Hoffenheim record signing. Haven't seen enough of him to, to speak about him, but yeah I think strength and depth of the squad is is good. 
of course, yourself were were so well known for your for your free kicks, yeah, um, and for your penalties as well. If I pushed each of you to pick one Premier League player to take a penalty for you that you need to score, which Premier League player are you picking? I'd pick Harry Kane. Okay. I just think in the, in the the tough moments. He steps up. Okay, people will say he missed for England. I think Harry right. Kane well, he's only missed one, hasn't he? Yeah. But Harry Kane is... Um, yeah, I'd he, go with that. Yeah, he's very, very go good. Yeah. Both pick Harry Kane. Yeah, we'll I'd go, go with that. It's a good yeah. choice. Yeah. Um, another player I'd like to talk about that's scoring at the minute, who was on loan at Leeds, is Eddie Nketa. Now, he was underrated a bit, I think. Yeah. He's come back. Mikel Arteta has put him in the team with Jesus being injured. He's picking up goals. What did you make of him when he was at Leeds? Are you surprised? Yeah, I'm surprised he didn't. Well, he played, you know, and he'd done very well at Leeds. I was surprised when he was recalled back to Arsenal. But, um, yeah, it's just, it just proves that He's got a knack for scoring goals, been in the right place at the right time. Walks very hard for the team. I think for any players, I think Mikel Arteta has done a remarkable job. At Arsenal, he's got rid of all the kind of bad eggs within the, within the squad, uh, the dead wood, and, and he's got young, hungry players in with a mixture of experience as well. And um, yeah, Eddie stepped up. You know, Gabriel Jesus has got injured. He's got his opportunity and he's, uh, he's stepping up to the plate. Yeah, in Ketia, fair play to, to Arteta, I feel like, Sam, because... Matured into yeah. it, hasn't he? And there was big, 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 big news that he was going to leave on a free or certainly a smallish fee because he was going to he let his contract run out this last season, didn't he? And they managed to persuade him to stay. And, and on the back of that, they must have got some comfort off the manager that he was going to get some games in. Because, you know, it was the time of his life to either move on and play first team football for somebody rather than be be a bit part player he was for Arsenal before. And a nice wage increase and as a well. Nice wage. <laughs> of course. Uh, that that <laughs> kind of helps it yeah. a bit. That's the so. agent speaking, Sam. I always get a funny look off a player, you know, when uh, when he signs a new contract. It's a bit more me me and my sarcasm, you know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, they come strolling in like I mean, new contract, yeah. Good wage, get rise, yeah. Yeah. Now you must play better. <laughs> what? I said you must play better. Well, good. It's not good enough now. You've doubled your wages, so I'm not expecting double the performance, but I want at least 10% more. Yeah. I want you sitting on your laurels thinking, oh, I like me, it's a nice new big car again, like what, got the wife a nice big car as well, you know. So, and, and it changes some people into not being as good as they were before. They lose a little bit of hunger. Lose the hunger, they do, yeah. You know, so, so I always warn them and, uh, politely, and, you know, they look at me and smile a little bit, but I'm being serious. You know, you, you, we demand more from you. If yeah. you're getting that that contract, you've got that that you know extra wealth to secure your family. Um, we really do expect more dedication and better performances. And you, and you're seeing that from Inketia, definitely. Oh, absolutely. And, um, yeah. At Arsenal, Mikel Arteta yeah. doing a great job, and another man that's doing a great job is Eddie Howe as well. How are you rating his time at, at Newcastle, and how are you rating Newcastle's chances of of Champions League qualification? Yeah, in? well. Eddie's a great guy. He was my manager at Bournemouth. Um, I've got a lot of time from. I was a year older than Eddie, so he used to call me into the office when, Ian, I'm not going to start you today or you're not going to be in the team. And obviously I'd be frustrated, but as a manager, you have to respect his decision. Um, I've been up to go to many a games up at Newcastle and delighted with the job that he's doing up there. Um, I think when they brought him in, I think it was purely survival, trying to survive and stay in. I think they finished in the top half of the table. I think the recruitment was good. Absolutely. I think um, I think Steve Nixon did a, a really good job in getting the right characters. Eddie, the attention to detail that Eddie goes into when he's trying to sign a player, obviously checks with ex-managers, ex-teammates to make sure that they're not going to disrupt the dressing room. And, uh, and the players that have come in, obviously the fourth signing was Kieran Trippier, um, who's been there, seen it, done it, and, yeah. and and a great player, and and they've just come from st- strength to strength, yeah. So he's um he's a good guy. Obviously, I'm delighted at the the position that they're in the table, and um, I actually know Amanda Stavely as well, so that's why she invites me up to quite a few a lot a few of the games, and hopefully they can finish in in the in the Champions League spots. But I think if they can finish in Europe, I think every Newcastle fan would be happy. 
yeah, now obviously in the in the uh, League Cup final as well, Sam. So it's looking like it's going to be a great season for them. Oh, well, it, it's staggering for me the combination of the of Eddie and his and his backroom staff, and the new owners getting it so right so quickly. I mean, it's I very it's unheard of to to somebody to come and buy a new football club and and get it right. Man City didn't. Years. You know, they had the struggles for mm. years, like you mean Liverpool under these owners and uh and I think Everton. You look at that like what's been in put in there in terms of millions and millions, five hundred million pounds of where they are. And then all of a sudden Newcastle hit the ground running for the first time and got almost instant success on on and off the field with that recruitment policy that they've got, like you mean. So and not done, and not got sucked into, uh, you know, the the inflation of prices because everybody thinks they've got billions and billions yeah. just to throw at it, which other clubs have done in the past. Or bringing in them big kind of names yeah. that they've been linked with everybody, Correct. but they brought mm. the right characters in, and gradually it's going to take probably a few years step by step. But so yeah, I think they've done it the right the best, way. He's got the best job of his entire life because he's now got the fans; they love him. Mm -hmm. He's got the support behind it by the amount of wealth and choosing the right players. And I think Dan Ash was there now, isn't he? Yeah, uh, Dan's, from Brighton, yeah. Yeah, in, you know, um, obviously known Dan from his West Brom days in England when What's I was his there. Role? Sorry? He's a d director of football, isn't he? Yeah. In terms of recruitment, he, he's well versed in that in that area for many many years. So oh, and he came from Brighton. That's right. Yeah, they had to he's a bit West Brom in England, like you mean. So, yeah. so he's he's got another one in, in the in in the in the fray about moving the club forward. But you what are. surprises me even more so is where they are now, because I actually looked at the squad and thought, you know, it'll be okay. It'll be top, yeah, top half. You know, probably eight, ninth, tenth, at the very least. But if, to look where they are, and if you look at Newcastle again, and you look at what great, fantastic, everybody's going to be sick of me watching this podcast with Richard Wrigley about <laughs> how great they are defending. Yeah, but even Dan Bourne, playing him on left back, you're yeah. thinking, yeah. Man, it's incredible what he's yeah. done. And obviously he's doing overlaps, underlaps, yeah. then he's scoring. It's um, And then trips, I think, yeah, I just think it's a... It's good characters when they within the dressing room. That's what you need. You need it. Eddie, Eddie's all about team bonding and and togetherness. And um, it looks like it's a it's an amazing group of lads that go out and and fight for each other. And they have a goal scorer, don't they? In yeah, Wilson. Well, Wilson or Isak that they took. Yeah, yeah Isak on the bench. Yeah, obviously putting the pressure on Callum as well. Bruno, uh, mm. Joe Linton. Yeah. Joe Linton's been oh, amazing. He's a revelation yeah. now in midfield, isn't he? So and Almiron's picked up a few goals. Almiron, as well. yeah. yeah. So the the belief within the whole group. Is a uh, high and um and, and the quality of the spending has been what we're talking about as well. So they haven't looks like they haven't wasted any any money, you know what I mean? And they yeah. haven't gone overboard and said we'll pay hundred and twenty one yeah. million. So like what Chelsea are doing. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's tried to extract extract more money out of Newcastle. So what would have normally been a thirty million pound player when the Saudis took over, that would be a fifty million pound player if they went for him. Whereas somebody else mm -hmm. would probably have gone in for 20 or 30 million. Yeah. But when Newcastle come with all this money, they go, oh, well, come on, let's ramp the price up. And often it's paid um, and, and it's hard to resist. But yeah, great job, I think. Well, Eddie Howe's Newcastle doing really well at the minute. Um, Eddie Howe, you're one of your former managers. Another one of your former managers, Roy Keane. Yeah. Any good stories? What was it like to be managed by him? <laughs> Yeah, diff different. Yeah, it different, was br yeah. brilliant to play with him. I obviously played with him in the in the Ireland team. Um, I've got a, a lot of time and respect for for Roy, um, but I think as a manager, I think you have to change compared to a player. So he signed me when I went to when I was out playing out in Spain. I came back and I signed, and it was Andy Cole, uh, Dwight York that had signed at the same time as me. But I spent most of my time on the back pitch with it with the twenty three. So it was. Um, wasn't the best experience or something, but yeah, I've got a lot of time for Roy. Mm, he's mad. <laughs> Good yeah, mad or? Uh, I'm not so sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's great though, because he can get away with it, can he? He really seems to have created a character, yeah, a TV he has character. Yeah, he's his own character on the TV, but I think he's slightly, 
Slightly there. Just like the, the, the few demons, I think, like, you know what I mean? But he manages to control them well. And it's very, obviously, <laughs> everybody sees it. It's very, very entertaining. I love the Micah Richards, Roy Keane combination. Yeah. They're yeah. completely two different people. But <laughs> yes, I do love that. Well, that's good entertainment in it. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, fantastic player. Fantastic time he had. And I did a great job at Sunderland when he first got uh, his first manager's job by actually getting them promoted and then, and then obviously from there on didn't go didn't go so well. But uh, I, I don't know what it was like with uh, Martin in Ireland. But you know, it seems it seems that one or two situations came out where I don't think Roy can hold back when he goes. He goes. So I mean, but yeah, unbelievable, brilliant character. If you were picking three former, you could have managers, managers, players yeah. that you've worked okay. with, three former ones to go on a night out with. Obviously, this is the juicy, real stuff that right, people okay. want to know. Who would you? Who would you pick, and why? Robbie Keane definitely. Won. Oh yes, Robbie Absolutely. loves a, he loves yeah. a little sing song. Yeah. Uh, obviously, yeah. he's a, he's a character. Um, yeah, he's kind of the centre of a, of a party. Uh, probably uh, definitely Robbie. Um, probably the other one would be Gary Kelly, who I played with at Leeds. He played at right back. He's yeah. my uncle. He is purely nuts. So uh, it would be it would be it. a fun <laughs> night out, and probably someone like Harry Kuehl, who I was very good friends with uh, at Leeds. But um, yeah, definitely them three. Yeah. Yeah, Do you Rob. fancy that night out, Sam? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> in <laughs> Dublin, in <laughs> Dublin, Sam, you'd oh, love it. Oh, yeah, in Dublin, yeah, yeah, has, yeah. has to be in Dublin on a night yeah, out. Yeah, absolutely. Irish players in Dublin. I yeah. can imagine that is... Englishmen in Dublin don't get to bed until <laughs> three in the morning or four. Don't worry about that. So <laughs> I think that, uh, yeah, Robbie, I've experienced at Soccer Aid. So uh, um, we've had many a, many a good night at the, at the bar. and uh, He does like a little sing-song, doesn't he? He does, doesn't he? Yeah. It's very good. Very good. Him. Very entertaining. Very entertaining. That sounds like a good night out yeah. to me. Um, before we wrap up for today, I just wanted to get your final thoughts on. So were you at Leeds when Rio and Alan Smith went from Leeds to United? Was that around your time? Yes. What was that like when a player goes from a, a staunch rival to another club? And I'm thinking Jorginho to Arsenal at the transfer window, Chelsea, Chelsea to Arsenal. How can a player go from... Arrival to another club. How does it work? How is it? What's the reaction? I think most Leeds fans are quite acceptable that they're going to lose players and they're going to go to different different clubs. Um, but I think once you make the step across towards Manchester United, the fans very soon pretty much hate you. There's an ex-player of Leeds. There was, you know, the fixtures would come out. They're the two games that you would look for. It's the rivalry, the buzz leading into it, the week leading into it. Um, yeah, they were pretty special and used to love obviously playing playing against them, especially if you didn't beat them many times. But when we did, they, 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 were, they were good days. Yeah, but not special times, yeah. yeah and of you. course, I think the top of the tree leads at the moment as well as Man United and trying to get there. Same with Liverpool and Man United, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then for many years, it was... Never really considered that great Man United versus your club, wasn't it? Man yep. City, like yeah. You know, they're not the noisy neighbours anymore. Right now, Sam. No. Not the noisy neighbours anymore, are they? I'm still upset about that game, Sam, and that was a few weeks ago. Now, oh yeah. <laughs> so I mean, so you know, it's. I think. I mean, Bolton fans have a massive rivalry against Manchester United, and I used to go, "What are you talking about?" You know what I mean? It's just, you know, I, I don't know when it went stem back to when they won the cup in, was, but that was straight after the. Munich air disaster, you know what I mean? But, you know, I, but sometimes without, without help off your fellow managers, you look at the rivalry between your fans and that, they go, well, just a minute, because I might need to not need a bit of help off, off Sir Alex in and let me use his training ground when we were struggling, you know, when we are going to the playoffs, like you mean. So stuff like that, and you're going, you know, we can't have the same coach, coach firm as Man United when we're going down to Cardiff. And no. Going, Shut up. This was in the boardroom, by the way. I'm going, you, we get the coaches because they're the best ones. I didn't realise it ran oh, that deep. Oh, man, I'm telling you, it's it's, it's murder. But I, I, I bet the boardroom, I, I bet the guys in the boardroom did listen to you saying, we're doing it. Absolutely, yeah. That yeah. too, and that were it. Yeah. Well, but luckily it's me. I had that power as a manager. Yeah. <laughs> Probably wouldn't I'll get away with that now. But I mean, I mean the most ferocious, I'll tell you two most ferocious, evil, 
football matches I've ever faced, and you won't believe it, in fan base terms. Okay. All right. Blackburn Burnley. Ooh, okay. Unbelievably hostile, absolutely horrible atmosphere. Mm-hmm. All the Burnley fans could only travel from Burnley in coaches and have a ticket to prove it. Uh, mm-hmm. And vice versa in the return leg. And then it was West Ham Millwall. I didn't realise West Ham In the Millwall championship. Oh, man. West Ham actually shut the bottom end of the tier down behind the goal and only let the Millwall fans go in the top tier at Upton Park. And it were like, oh, you were like that going, wow, oh, this is this is hostile. This is evil. And you could really feel you it. You could feel it. Yeah, you could feel it. In the, I mean, obviously, we managed to win both games. And our managers. Yeah, I remember when, <laughs> so when I played, was right, like, you know, I played I mean. a Millwall before and literally yeah. they, they, they're wanting to get over on the, on the pitch, pitch to get you. <laughs> Does that intimidate you as a player? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you wind them up and you're thinking like you're running down the tunnel then you come out to get on the bus after the game yeah. and there's literally about 20 of them outside wanting to kill you. Yeah. So it's um, yeah, it's not a nice nice experience but probably the worst one for me was um, when we played with Leeds, uh, Leeds against Galatasaray out there. Oh. We literally got off the flight and there was yeah. thousands and thousands Literally like banners, flares, like welcome to hell. Welcome to hell. And we had yeah. the tank and armed security running alongside. The a boat. tank? Yeah, yeah. And we got to the stadium, I'd say two hours before the game. It was full. And we're, we're going to shop. But obviously then it was two Leeds fans that lost their lives where, um, yeah, the, the game probably in today would have been called off. It yeah. should have been called off because mm. we weren't in the right frame of mind. The lads were getting phone calls to the hotel room threatening or whatever so it was a it was a horrible experience but yeah wow. well thank you so much for joining us today thank you because um, as, as we realised yesterday was a pretty busy day for you so we really appreciate you coming down and, and chatting to us and it's really nice to have the insights thanks for you. no problem thank at all you thank you much. cheers thank you thank you so much Ian and, and Sam thank you as always see you again soon we will we'll see yes, you next week Robbie I think isn't it? yes next week we will be joined by Robbie Fowler on No Tippy Tappy Football brought to you by William Hill thank you so much for joining us again <laughs>